Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are going to get started shortly, but I just wanted to say hi to all my amazing panelists. It's so good to see you. Thank you for having me today. Y'all look amazing. Thanks, LaCora, for getting us started and welcome everyone. We will be as quick as we can so we can get right to the conversation. I want to thank everyone for being here as we hear more about our solutions that emerge from the Road to Transformation listening series earlier this year. We have begun our time together by first acknowledging the sacred lands on which we live, learn, and work. The land we call Minnesota includes the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of 11 sovereign nations. We honor those who were here before us on this land, the seven Anishinaabe nations of the Chippewa and Ojibwe and the four Dakota nations. Along with these 11 tribes, we want to honor all indigenous people of this territory, many from tribes that were never formally recognized by the federal government. We address this injustice by sharing power, building power and yielding power in authentic and sustained relationship with indigenous communities to catalyze transformational change. As a statewide community foundation, we believe that women and girls are the experts our state needs to shape real lasting solutions. Every two years, we release the state's leading research on the status of women and girls in Minnesota with the Center on Women, Gender and Public Policy at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School. We know our research is not complete until we hear directly from women and girls and gender expansive people across the state about how the data shows up in their real day-to-day -day lives. And this is what grounded our listening sessions this year. We are here today to reflect on some of what we hear, uh, have heard with incredible panel of partners and experts who not only know the realities and the vision of women and girls around the state, they work directly on leading the change we all want to see. Our work is quite literally guided by the voices of women, girls, and gender expansive people in communities, their experiences, their wisdom, and their right to live in a more just Minnesota. We know that to realize our vision, we have to imagine a new day where all people get exactly what they need to thrive. Before we dive into what I know will be an incredible panel conversation moderated by Lissa Jones, I'd like to welcome back my colleague, LaCora bradford Kesty, our Director of Community Impact, to share more about how we got started and what we learned in our listening sessions earlier this year. LaCora. Thank you, Gloria. As Gloria mentioned, um, while data sets us in a direction, community voices and priorities shape and inform the interventions and investments we target. That is why we held our Road to Transformation listening series in March of 2021. And as we approach a year of living in a pandemic and the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd, we gathered with communities and the one year anniversary, so we gathered with those communities uh, and who are experiencing the greatest impacts from COVID-19, civil unrest, state sanctioned violence and the greatest economic stresses of our time. We partnered with 13 grantee partner organizations across Minnesota to really bring the data from our status of women and girls research report to life. Through the nine listening sessions, uh, we spoke with 83 women and girls, gender expansive people, and learned from their experiences and what they heard um, and they had to endure as mothers, caregivers, essential workers, and as women employed in the sectors hit hardest through this pandemic. We listened as they told us the many ways they continue to engage and support their families and communities throughout the events of 2020. And we covered a lot of ground in these nine in-depth sessions. And while none of these stories were surprising, they were at times raw and painful and bold and powerful. We wanted to hear what visions, hopes, and dreams they have for themselves, their families, and their communities. We wanted to learn about what was getting in the way of their power and dignity. And we heard from participants across the state that economic inequity exists before a girl is even born. That Black mothers worry about the possibility of losing their children every time they leave their homes. And we talked with Indigenous people of all ages in Minnesota whose mothers, sisters, and daughters go missing and murdered at truly alarming rates. 
From our research, we know that the inequities compound over a lifetime to impact the financial well-being and health of older women, particularly those who are LGBTQ+. And in our sessions, we heard that rural women were not recognized in their full power and stories. And women's safety and security and authority continue to be vulnerable in the workplaces across our state. So let's pause a moment. That's a lot to take in, right? Um, let's close our eyes for a second and take a deep breath. So the results, right? The results from our listening series are already informing our statewide agenda for gender and racial justice as we invest in grant making, policy, strategic partnerships, narrative change, and research. What we heard from participants will continue to shape our work for years to come as their insights have guided the way to our expanded investments in safety, economic justice, holistic well-being, and reproductive justice and community power and leadership. I'll just take a few minutes to share a few highlights from our challenges and opportunities the women and girls in Minnesota are facing today. So in our listening session with Black mothers and caregivers, we heard, as a Black mother, we have to protect ourselves. We have to protect our space. We have to protect our children, our jobs, our health, mental health, and let us not forget Black men. George Floyd called for his mother. The solution is the Black women. People need to listen to us. And from our listening session with Native women, participants talked about a shared vision for a future of healing and unity in their communities that's rooted in Indigenous traditions, compassionate accountability, and empowerment for young people. One participant shared, if we can start to see that the systems in which we live today were intended to limit us and restrict us from living a good life, we can get back to the way that, used, that we used to live as people, youth learning the language, our traditional ceremonies. If we can start to get back our identity as Indigenous people, then we won't continue to perpetuate the violence we learned because we had to survive. We heard that rural women contribute to the rich community assets of rural Minnesota. They know that changing the narrative and the polarized political landscape in rural Minnesota is key to ensuring that rural women and girls, families and communities thrive. One panelist asked, who is telling the story of rural places? What story are they telling and why? We need to reframe the narrative and ask, what assets does rural Minnesota have? Our session with girls, from across Minnesota inspired all of us. They are already leaders, y'all. One participant shared, seeing diverse representation makes me more confident in myself. We also heard about unequal pay for working women. And we heard again and again about the struggle to find affordable, accessible childcare. When you have to work nights and weekends, that doesn't always work. There is no daycare that does that. So you're at the mercy of relatives to be successful. And finally, from older women, we heard about the isolation they feel, the financial burdens, the fear of being wiped out by a catastrophic health emergency. Some of them even still paying off student loans and while taking care of multiple generations in their homes. So as participants shared their experiences in all nine listening sessions, they also offered solutions about the specific ways that all Minnesota women and girls can live healthy, hopeful, joyful lives with dignity. They shared with us how systems both intentionally and unintentionally disrupt their ability to thrive. Here, you'll see some of the solutions that emerged across all nine sessions. One, we heard so many of our panelists say, we're not down and out. We are people who have done more with less. We heard resilience and determination and love from our panelists again and again. 
Women know what they are, is that they are essential parts of their families. Their role is so often to sustain a circle that cannot be broken. We look after many generations and we support one another even when circumstances are hard. And so at the Women's Foundation, we are guided by the principle that the people most impacted by inequity hold the wisdoms and solution to lead us to lasting change. For an in-depth read on the themes and solutions from each of the nine listening sessions, you'll find a link to our website in the chat. And now it is my greatest pleasure to welcome Lissa Jones to introduce our panelists and moderate a discussion as they reflect on the themes and the solutions that we heard from folks in community all across the state. And so as many of you know, uh, Lissa Jones is the host of Urban Agenda at KMOJ and the host of Black Market Reads uh, for the Givens Foundation of the African American Literature, a podcast that amplifies the voices of Black authors and writers. She has been our partner in moderating a brilliant conversation on the genius of Black women last year. And we're so glad you're back with us uh, to lead this conversation about the solution we heard from our listening sessions. And so I just want to say thank you, Lissa, and welcome. Oh, thank you, LaCora, and thank you, Gloria, for having me. Thank you to the Women's Foundation and to our wonderful panelists. LaCora, I'm so glad to be back. Every time I'm in relationship with the Women's Foundation, it just reminds me how delighted I am to be a woman. So let's go ahead and get started because you didn't come to hear from me. You came to hear from these phenomenal women who have solutions to the questions and the, the um, answers to the questions that women posed in the listening circles. I'm delighted to introduce you to Sister Nita Kellogg, founder and executive director of Project Diva International, which is a Women's Foundation of Minnesota grantee partner and facilitator of the status of girls in Minnesota listening session. Welcome. Dr. Joy Lewis is also here, author, coach, and founder of Healing Justice Foundation, also a Women Foundation, Women's Foundation of Minnesota grantee partner. Welcome, Dr. Joy. Angelica Klebisch, I hope I said your name correctly. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Senior Advisor on Special Projects and Policy for the Minnesota Attorney General's Office and former Senior Director of Policy and Community Development at CLUES, a Women's Foundation of Minnesota grantee partner. She's also a facilitator of Economic Status of Working Women and Families listening session. This is just phenomenal. I read those reports. Very, very eye-opening. Alicia or Alicia, I might have to ask, so I'm going to forgive, ask for forgiveness. Thank you, Kozlowski, Community Relations Officer at the City of Duluth, panelists during COVID-19's impact, Women on the Frontlines listening session. Welcome. And Candace Montgomery, co-founder of Black Visions, a Women's Foundation of Minnesota grantee partner and a partner and mentor of young leaders with the Women Foundation of Minnesota's Innovators Program. Welcome. We're delighted to have you. Let's go ahead, if you don't mind, ladies, let's jump right in. I know time is precious. On this call, we all know how much power lives in community. In our listening sessions, we heard so many examples of how community showed up and showed out in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder to care for one another and leverage community power for justice and change. As the Women's Foundation focuses on building power and leadership with our state's communities, we know that collective power is a force for transformation. In your experience, Candace and Dr. Joy, what role does collective action and the power within communities most pushed to the margins play in transforming Minnesota for gender and racial justice? Either of you can go first, somebody's gotta go. Hey, Candace, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Joy. Um, and thank you so much for this question. Um, when I read it ahead of time and was thinking about it, you know, the word that came to me is everything. 
um, that collective action has a role to do with anything to do with transformation. Um, and that's largely because that's what it requires, you know, to really see something fully transformed, all parts of it must be engaged um, to actually see that transformation. And when we're looking at societal transformation, racial justice, economic justice, all of those things, all of the people, especially those who have been directly impacted by the negative aspects of um, those systems or reasons for change need to be part of um, uh, making that change. And I think that collective action in under that definition can be really broad, can be broad and across the spectrum. We know that there are going to be some of us who are here, who are leading the meetings, who are leading the actions, who are leading the activities, and some of us who are participating by showing up, you know, and that might be for a variety of reasons, um, but that, that that participation has to come at some point in um, some way. Sometimes it's just as simple as you know, making sure that you actually get to the voting pool and a booth and bringing five people with you. Um, I think it's, uh, it is critical. And the way in which I see power is through collective. I think that oftentimes um, in our world, we define power as people who sit in important seats. Um, and I think that the power um, when anything has ever been changed, it comes from people. It comes from the people who aren't sitting in those important seats, um, but are actually demanding something different. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, and this is something I encourage us all to really think about and figure out how we're redefining power um, so that our community members are not just, you, you know, and we have some great elected officials, don't get me wrong, but just looking to elected officials or the person who runs their organization or whatever to be the sort of carrier of change, but understand that they have an active role um, in, in taking that on. So I'll stop there and let Dr. Joy pop in. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. And thank you for the question. Um, you know, much like what Candace said, you know, it it is the collective. And I think that it also is the fact that um, those folks who, um, it the people who think that they are in power or who have have so deemed themselves to be in power, who said that people are pushed to the margins. I think that it's the collective who said that, but we're actually not in the margins, right? That we actually are in the center and we're going to push back to the center. And so even though um, the folks who may have been in these formal roles and say, oh, okay, we are in charge, that it is the collective that actually shifts the margin to the center um, and, you know, begins to take over. And we saw that and we see that here um, in, in here in the Twin Cities. And I'm, I'm particularly moved by, um, by young people, um, by, by women, by um, gender non-conforming folks, by trans folks who are like coming out and saying, you know what, you're not gonna push us over to the side. We're gonna stand, we're gonna be in the middle, we're gonna organize and that we're going to make sure that um, we are on the map and we're not gonna ask for permission. And so, um, and it's, it's been really inspiring to me, I think as a Gen Xer, right, where we were, um, we, you know, we did our things and we, we have done our things, but I think what we have been able to learn or what I have learned, I think, from young people is that they're not asking for permission uh, around that and not, not asking to say, like, can we, you know, can we be, can we, do we get to be um, in the center? They're like, no, we just don't take up space. And it's the collective that we don't, when we're in the collective space, um, that we get to move from the margin to the center. And I think that that's how it's able to happen. And it's not cute. It can be, it can look ragged. It doesn't have to be all, you know, um, respectable looking and that you can just sort of move there. And it's very inspiring. And I think that that's the kind of movement that we're in right now. Um, the folks just come out and they're like, we're going to do it the way that we want to do it. And we're going to move in, in that way. So with that, I'll put a comma and make sure that other folks get to speak. Thank you. I see a lot of, thank you, thank you, Candace. thank you, Dr. Joy. I see a lot of nodding heads. Does somebody want to speak on something before I move on to the next question? Or are you okay? All right. That's excellent. Thank you so much. The next question, and of course now I haven't been able to ask for the proper pronunciation of your name, so I hope I do not chop it up again. Is it Alicia or Alicia, please? 
as Alicia. Thank you for your grace. I really appreciate it. This question is going to come your way and also to Candace. During the listening sessions, we heard from women and girls that without safety at home, school, and work, they can't feel secure or do well in other areas of their life. When we look at the data in the status of women and girls in Minnesota report, which is really NIDA, um, we see that the rates of violence against Indigenous and Black women are staggeringly high. That Native American women are 70% more likely than white women to have experienced violence in the past year. And almost 85% of Native American women have experienced violence in their lifetime. The Women's Foundation of Minnesota invested in the first in the nation missing and murdered Indigenous Women's Task Force and the newly launched Missing and Murdered African American Women's Task Force to identify the roots of this violence and to recommend solutions. These policy actions are one step in working to better understand and secure safety for Black and Native women in Minnesota. But we know that many solutions are required for women and girls in communities and in all communities to feel safe so they can be well. How can we reimagine response systems so that women and girls and their communities can be truly safe? And what are some solutions that can begin to address the violence against Black and Indigenous women? And I think I'm going to open this up to everyone who wants to respond, first deferring to Nita and Alicia and, and, and Halika. I'll let one of the two of y'all go since I've been talking. Oh, I, I'd be happy to jump in. Um, and, and I also wanted to just start in, uh, share that my Ojibwe name is uh, Ozawa Anakwadukwe. Um, it means yellow cloud woman, and it's always important for me to just introduce myself in that way. Um, and I really appreciate the question and also want to just acknowledge that there are so many other folks in this space, community advocates, um, leaders who have been and are already leading um, on this, this front. And also to say thank you to the foundation who has invested in, as you shared, the task forces, but also safety audits here in Duluth. Of course, we're trying to fix a 520 year issue of colonization um, in addressing violence. Um, and that's a really large task. And I see it as like a really giant, un layer of um, onion peels, pulling back the layers. Um, but right now we have a ton of momentum, a real sense of urgency. I loved that use of the word ragged earlier. Up here on the res, we use the word rugged. <laughs> um, and that's how this work can often be. There are root causes, contemporary causes, and of course factors that put all women of color, um, girls and two-spirit folks at risk. You know, we're looking back at the historical factors of boarding school where violence, sexual violence occurred, um, assimilation, land grab policies that, you know, lead to when you strip away people from their, their land, their language, their people, has led to a lot of invisibility and erasure. And historical trauma is not historical, I can promise you, as we all know what's happening today. And so when we look at you know, the need for systems of care that are trauma informed and grounded in key principles, right, of safety, of igniting power, of worth. It's underpinning safety is equity for all women and girls. Um, and I look at it also as how do we impact our leadership and matriarchs that were the leaders, the life givers, the backbones of our community? How do we increase our social and economic? opportunity of health and wealth generation. And um, somebody mentioned before about redefining power and it made me think about how we redefine power as well as wealth on our, based on our own communities, you know, from indigenous people to Latinx, the Asian heritage um, and more, we look at wealth as being more than just money. Um, and I stepping back and see that as a fundamental worldview difference between indigenous ways of looking at the world where we don't own things, we belong to each other and where we are related to everything um, rather than with the normalization of whiteness, we see things as being approached as an economic resource. So we look at a tree and we can say, that's my relative, but for non-native folks, they might look at a tree and say, that's lumber, that's a resource. Um, so there's a fundamental difference in our being 
of how we're associated with things in that way. And thus, if we look at things as a resource rather than everything as a relative and we're in relation and we belong to one each other and we take care of each other, then therefore we become disposable. And so we've seen disinvestment, colonial exclusion. And I think that the starting place is understanding what are the priorities for tribal nations and urban peoples, you know, recalibrating those resources across sectors of philanthropy, business, education, it's meaningful engagement, data collection, and how we use that data, capacity building, focus initiatives across those community health dimensions, education, healthcare, housing, employment, it's visibility in media um, on our terms, it's amplifying our own stories and strengths. And of course, it looks like focused coalition building led by um, black and brown people, as we've seen with the uh, Indigenous um, MMIW, as well as the African Heritage um, Task Force, which is the first in the entire country, are critical mechanisms for how we advance that statewide and local partnerships across right philanthropy, government, um, to drive those forward. But would be happy to go in, into more specifics. But I think a lot of powerful things can happen when our matriarchs come together at that confluence of understanding our history, our contemporary presence, and how they're Futures are really braided in our shared liberation. I am struck by so many things you said, but 528 years, Nita. I love how you said, Alicia, Alicia um, about the relationships and owning our stories and strengths, because I wanna bring it down to each one of us on this call and who's watching have to make a decision to make sure that we are safe. And when it comes to the girls, one, things that, one thing that stood out to me was, they mentioned about like like riding the buses, right? Like something as simple as riding the buses because they a lot of them in the inner city are having to ride the bus to school. And understanding that they were like, you know, we have to be on the bus with people who ha may have mental challenges, who may have um, sexual things going on that have been, you know, documented with the police or just the fear of what's going on in the community and how they don't feel safe riding the buses, right? And as the adults, at what point do we decide that we're gonna not just leave our high school kids to fend for themselves, right? So again, like I feel when it comes to owning our stories and our strengths and the relationship piece, we coming back to community and making sure that as, a, as you, the person, seeing kids or seeing young people um, in the streets moving throughout their days and trying to navigate these systems and their lives, like making sure that we're showing up for them to make sure that they're safe, but making that choice to do that. So I just wanted to throw that in. I, Alicia, you, you really touched on a lot of great stuff. We leave our high school babies just Angelica, is there anything you'd like to add? I think Candace was actually unmuting. I'm sorry, Candace. I, I apologize. I was looking left and I should have been looking right. Forgive me, ladies. No, this is a juicy one. I think all of us should add something here. I will be um, brief just to add um, two, two points. Um, one in particular that was that really like you know, continues to strike a chord, but was in a, was recently in a space with some, some comrades from across the country and um, one particular leader who I really look up to, her name is Tony Michelle Williams. She's the executive director of SNAPCO, which is Solutions Not Punishment based in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, is, is a black trans woman. And one of the things that she was talking about as we were talking about, you know, how do we really wrestle in a time when we're questioning the current systems that are meant to hold us uh, safe, whether or not they're working, including policing? Um, how do we also hold um, that Black trans women in particular are murdered and killed at rates high above any other? Um, and I think one of the things that I is necessary for change when we're thinking about the safety of of women and girls is one recognizing that uh, black trans women and women of color die at alarmingly high rates. And we are almost uh, echo quiet when that happens. And so what she had said during this convening is like, I want the death of one of my sisters to be just as high a priority 
and us to move in such urgency as we do when the many men of color die at the hands of police, right? Like what would it actually look like for our society to, and not to compare them, but to say, we're gonna give it as much energy, you know? We're gonna give it as much energy. We're gonna start uprisings for black trans women as well. We are gonna change policy in their name as well, right? We are gonna resource the solutions to keep them safe as well. And so that is one, one particular thing that I wanna bring to the conversation as for something for all of us to think about is how, when that happens, are we prioritizing it with the same level of energy as we do of the, the murders of others? And I think that speaks to women and girls in general as well. Um, and then the second thing that in response directly to the question is, I think that when we are re reimagining the systems that women and girls can rely on, we need to imagine them with care at the center. I would say that most of the systems that we are meant to rely on do not have care at the center. Most of the systems that survivors of sexual or domestic violence have to rely on, honestly, even as a survivor, I will say, you have to legitimize and um, make sure people believe you that that's actually happening just to get the basic safety and services that you deserve, right? Um, and so I think that that is part of what that reimagining looks like is how do we actually believe survivors? How do we center their needs? And how do we approach them with love and care and build systems and fight for policies that actually do that? You know, um, I think is one of the really big things that I would like to offer. I'm glad you did, Candace. Thank you. And these topics are so big that it's impossible, quite honestly, in an hour to say, everything that needs to be said, but we do know that in a capitalist society, money's required, so let's pivot. Angelica, this is now coming to you, economic justice. We know that gender and racial, the racial wage gap have not narrowed in the last five years in Minnesota, and that factors like the wage gap, occupational clustering, and inaccessible, unaffordable child and elder care contribute to economic inequities that compound over a lifetime for women. Many participants in our listening sessions talked about how changing our care infrastructure, what Candace just said, would be transformative for their community and their family's economic prosperity and well-being. How might these changes be unique to specific communities? And what intergenerational solutions do you imagine in response to our care infrastructure problem? Uh, thanks for the question, Lisa. There's, a, like Candace said, it's such a juicy space where there's so much opportunity for policy improvements that could make a world of difference, especially for women in Minnesota and really everywhere. Um, as it happens at the uh, Office of the Attorney General, we're currently doing some work with a task force of 15 women uh, that are looking at issues of economic security through lots and lots of um, lenses, right? Lots of experiences there. And I think to your original question, that's where the value lies in connecting directly with people and community is often these policies are passed in a way that affects community in a way that isn't anticipated or that doesn't take into account the nuances of cultural application. So it's always important to get to hear directly from folks who are gonna be impacted by policy as much as possible. Uh, but to your point about care, there's it's no secret that child care especially is wildly unaffordable, right? Uh, when my daughter was not of school age, I paid more for child care than I did for my mortgage. Um, Dr. Christina Ewig has put out a report that says something to the effect of the cost of child care uh, per year is the same or more than a year worth of tuition at the University of Minnesota. I mean, it is that high. It is unaffordable. It's unavailable. It's quite scarce. And there's lots and lots of opportunities for improvement. I think on a policy level, first of all, considering how to subsidize child care would make a tremendous world of difference. And that could be government subsidized. That could be employer subsidized. It could be employer provided, right? There's lots of employers here in the Twin Cities that provide childcare directly on site that make it easier for women to stay in the labor force. And I say women because really studies are showing that women are still carrying the largest burden of caregiving responsibility. So for all intents and purposes, we're talking about women in the labor force here. I think um, additionally to that, 
we have a scarcity of affordable before and after school care. So even once our kids get into school age and we're thinking, whew, I'm so glad I don't have to pay that monthly childcare fee that was really putting a string on my family. Um, we still have to figure out what to do with their kids before and after school, because certainly my job doesn't end at 2.30. And right now we're all, you know, working remotely for the most part, but not all women are. And what about gig workers? What about frontline workers? What about hourly workers? What about retail workers, right? Healthcare workers. I mean, these folks are not experiencing the flexibility that is necessary when there is a child care gap like what we're seeing now. Uh, I think another tremendous policy would be um, expanding paid family leave. We don't have paid family leave. And who, anyone on this panel, who can afford to take 12 weeks of work without pay if you are a main provider in your family especially, right? So when I think about, uh, you know, workers in rural communities who are working at minimum or sub-minimum wage, they're not going to be able to take 12 weeks, six weeks, four weeks of unpaid time off to care for families when they have kids, when someone gets sick, when, you know, their elderly parent is requiring care, because we're also thinking about this um, uh a care providing sandwich, right? We know a lot of women are in a position where they are both raising children and caring for their elderly parents. And especially in communities like ours where multi-generational living structures are common and valued. So uh, having some more sensical um, structure for paid family leave that is longer than what is legally provided right now and that's actually paid would be a tremendous difference. Sick and safe leave. Uh, you know, was passed in St. Paul, what was that, 2017 or something like that, um, but it's certainly not statewide. Uh, and there's a lot of provisions in the Women's Economic Security Act of 2014 here in Minnesota that require that if an employer provides paid time off, they also have to require sick leave. But that's only if they provide paid time off. And again, a lot of gig workers don't have that kind of a benefit. Um, and then it's limited time. So making sure that sick and safe leave is paid and that it's expanded would make a difference. I'm a big fan of universal pre-K. I know it's controversial, but there's lots of studies showing the cognitive benefits for children and all the way through adulthood, the benefits that they can experience. And again, the relief on families when they're able to send their kid off to paid preschool. When uh, they expanded kindergarten here in Minnesota to full, da full days, what was that, like 20 13, 2014, something like that. It was one year after my son left kindergarten. I thought, oh man, if he had been in there full time and I didn't have to pay for that child. I mean, it, it really is a, a, a huge barrier for families. Then there's the issue of how much we're paying care providers. It's uh, par care providers are one of the lowest paid careers that require a four year degree early childhood care. It is, in, it is just absurd how little some of these people make. And let's be honest, these women, because again, most women in these fields. And so when you're paying, again, sub-minimum or minimum wage, who wants to do a job that's that hard? I mean, have you ever babysat? you know, your cousin's kids for a day, it's hard. And you're, now you're taking care of 30 kids of strangers of different ages who are going through all kinds of developmental phases and physical needs and emotional needs. And we're paying these women how much? No one wants to work in those jobs, right? And we're seeing that especially now during the pandemic and the economic crunch that that's provided where people are almost, you know, choosing where they want to spend their time now. We're seeing that that gap is going to get worse. So there's that. There's flexibility in work hours is another policy that would go a long way for people. Um, and we're seeing with the pandemic, especially folks who are not doing front uh, frontline provision work, um, that that flexibility is possible. So affecting that at a more systemic level would make a difference. Ensuring that there's care available on nights and weekends, right? Um, I'm thinking for instance of janitorial staff that's going in after hours and on weekend hours and there's no daycare during those hours. So that's a major problem too. I think if we were able to implement changes like this, women would be able to stay in the workforce for more hours, for more years in their career. And over the uh, course of a lifetime, you see that effect on their earnings, right? And that matters uh, because, you know, I'm thinking even of just like social security, how that's paid off based on how many hours a woman works over a lifetime. These effects just compound. So being able to implement these kinds of structural changes to ensure that women can participate in the labor force fully, steadily, and authentically would go a long way for families as a whole. I mean, my goodness sakes, I wish that you were in some kind of a policymaking role. Um, I'm, I mean, you are in the attorney general's office. I mean, obviously you're influencing people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are there. <laughs> you, you are nodding. So I want you to go ahead and not, what would you like to say? Would you like to add anything? No, that was amazing. 
I mean, on our end, again, we're in the trenches with the girls. And so our solution is getting them um, trained as childcare providers, you know, babysitting, certified, you know, to make sure that they can, you know, help with some of the lifting. But Angela, like you hit it on the head. That's perfect. You know, on this task force that I'm leading for the Attorney General's office, one of the women who's on it is Barbara Batiste, who led the office uh, uh, on the economic status of women for several years. And she has said that the number one indicator of how well a woman is going to do in the professional arena is whether or not they have children, like the number one thing, right? And those are not decisions that we should have to compromise on. We shouldn't have to feel like we can either pick full investment in a career or a family. And that contrast is still happening to us. And I think to your original question again, Lisa, about folks in community and uh, mobilizing for power, to your point just now, is we need more people in office who can reflect these values and who understand them tangentially, who have experienced them, who are out in community, who can powerfully advocate for them, because I think that's one of the biggest problems that's missing is, you know, the question that you asked about women and safety is it feels like a lot of policymakers just don't care about these issues. They are not prioritizing them. I'm doing some research on sexual trafficking and labor exploitation. And, you know, Alicia, you're talking about what happens, especially in the Native communities with women up there. And I am just scandalized that more isn't being done about this. And this, again, is just pointing to people not caring. Why, why would they want to deal with political landmines like undocumented labor workers, undocumented women being sexually and labor trafficked and exploited? It's not something that is near and dear to their communities, which is why more folks like us should be in office. Well, I completely concur, and you have my vote. I'm ready to go. Um, I, this is this is such. This is just, Dr. Joy. This is a question for you because we really need to do better spiritually. Can you say more about the about the significance of culturally specific mental health and healing interventions? And why drawing from cultural roots and traditions, what Alicia was saying, is effective in healing communities? Why is culture important in how we get better, Dr. Joy? Yeah, thank you for that. And um, thank you for the question. And I, I want to um, just start with this quote, actually, from um, Adrian Marie Brown that says, what's true um, is that trauma makes weapons of us and fools and secret keepers and collaborators in harm. If we are going to grow, we must embrace truth telling. We must get more passionate about healing than we are about punishing, right? And so I, I start there because all of the things that um, have been said and that we have been um, talking about and it's all sort of intertwined and why it's important to specifically make sure that we are talking about healing in the context of, um, of a culturally specific um, community healers is because we got to deal with stuff around secrets, y'all. We got to deal with the, the stuff around how it is embedded, how these systems have set up particular things for us to be in collusion um, and how it particularly sets up women and girls, right? And where we are particularly um, vulnerable um, within um, our communities and within our families and then within systems and how it also ties into the economic uh, pieces. We get harmed in our family systems, in our community systems, and then in these larger systems and um, a lot of, and, and then end up getting caught up in the criminal justice system, right? Because we can't talk about things that we have to be protected. And so the ways in which that um, we have a chance of being able to get free from um, the trauma that's happening is to actually be able to have some community healers who can speak to and understand um, these uh, actual um, uh, trauma uh, situations that have happened, that people will open up, where they're not being pathologized, right? Where folks are not being um, uh, felt like uh, or, or being like sort of pointed out to say something is wrong with you, but rather to say something has happened to you, right? And to your people and that we see you and that we can actually get free of this stuff and that people are not keeping those secrets to themselves. Because we only as sick as, sick as our secrets, right? And that if we can, can begin to um, actually use our 
um, ancestral uh, ways of being to actually get free of um, the ways to actually get these things up and out. So we're not holding and ingesting um, these kinds of traumas that are killing us, right? That we can actually get free from it because then we, and it's not individual, it's the kind of collective trauma, right? That we can then get free from. So it is critical that um, we have to heal in community around the stuff because there are a lot of secrets that are here. Don't say nothing. Don't, you know, uh, repeat. Don't tell on this person. Don't say nothing. And then we are harmed and it, it gets repeated and repeated and repeated. And then somebody ends up getting, getting hurt and not telling. And then we're in the system and it's just a cycle and that stuff has to be broken. I think about it when Candace says that when a trans woman is killed, particularly a black or woman who is not white, who's trans, we don't say anything. And that's also learned behavior that Absolutely. we can unlearn. Absolutely. Suzanne Keplinger, I, it's been a long time, Suzanne. She said the community healers need to be paid for their work, not, not need some accreditation standard and bill Medicaid. <laughs> so it's a vital role for philanthropy. Right on, Suzanne. All right. Period. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> an hour is too short, but we're going to bring it home by talking about policy. When you think about policy, there are many strategies, and as Angelica so beautifully, I mean, I was like, I wish I could, I'm glad this is recording, by the way, I want to send it to the squad and say, here's the list, right? Dig it, get it ready. All right, so what is one policy change or solution that you wish for, that you wish for, so that women, girls, and gender expansive people can thrive in Minnesota, knowing that we have such a long list? If you had to pick one, which would you pick? And perhaps we could start with, um, I'll just go around the screen, Nita. Just more on getting financial education to our kids in schools. That's the biggest one for me because what our children need to know the day that they graduate is how they're gonna sustain themselves and our schools are not preparing them for that. So that's the main thing that Project Eve International is focused on right now is getting that information to our girls, but we need policy change to help us with that. Excellent. If you can't money, manage your money, if you don't know where it's coming from, you have a real problem. Candace Montgomery, you understand something about fundraising. What's on your mind about policy change? Um, yes, I, I think that what I, if I could have one thing, I would like to see um, our housing and our health care budgets at the same level as our police budgets, if nothing else. Um, frankly, I'd like those police budgets to come all the way over to those budgets, but um, housing should be funded at $190 million a year in Minneapolis, um, just like the police. When they said women's genius on this panel, I knew it was coming, but here it is. It shows up in all five of you, and here we go on Helica. It is hard to pick one because, as Dr. Joy was saying, all of these systems are interconnected. You can't thrive economically if you don't have stable housing, if you don't have you know, access to transportation, if you're dealing with language barriers. I mean, there's just, it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost too much, right? Um, but I'm thinking about uh, universal healthcare. I'm thinking that healthcare is crippling for our families. Um, the cost of healthcare, the accessibility of healthcare, the inequity in um, treatment, right? Uh, you, I, I'm sure all of you are familiar with studies showing how Black women especially are mistreated by the healthcare system. So definitely fixing that, but salary transparency goes a long way. And let's hear it for raising the minimum wage. It is overdue. <laughs> let's hear it. I just added three more things to my list right on. And Alicia, please, what would you do? I agree. From language justice to housing, it's hard to pick, but you know, I just been thinking a lot about how often are people out here hustling paying out of pocket to fund solutions and gaps in our own communities. And so I would like to see more financial opportunities, grants and whatnot for um, entrepreneurship and to be able to enact our own initiatives unrestricted with the trust that our communities know best. But so often when I see dollars awarded, whether it's like the PPP loans to entrepreneurs and we're boxed out of those, access to so many resources that either geographically um, or by race, by gender, we're, we're excluded. There's always money for inequity. 
but somehow the money dries up when you say equity. Fascinating, not funny. Dr. Joy. I'm certainly going to, thank you. I'm certainly going to amplify uh, what uh, Suzanne has said, you know, um, in terms of uh, healers who I call invisible emotional laborers who are mostly unpaid invisible emotional laborers who um, need to be paid and folks should have access to be able to get access to healers at any time and be able to be paid and folks shouldn't have to do this on top of four other jobs that they're doing and trying to take care of everybody else and um, and then doing this in the voluntary capacity. But people should have access to community cultural cultural healers who are paid and able to be able to um, address the mental health needs in our community, period, dot. <laughs> You know, fortunately, we must have been doing well because we started just a minute or two behind, but we have a few minutes. Is there a thought you'd like to leave with this community? They are sharing much love for you in the chat. Thank you for all the people who see and hear and are listening to us. And thank you for the people who would vote for you on Helica. I'm telling you, you better run for office. It's, time is right. <laughs> What's a thought if you'd like to leave with the audience today? I would say let's continue to capitalize on the momentum that has been building in communities. I have not, I don't think I have seen in the last 15 or 20 years the kind of energy that is building now and the kind of attention that these issues are generating right now. I think there's some brilliant and powerful organizers, many of the panelists here included, who are, are doing a tremendous job of connecting the dots between making the noise and, and, and um, raising the energy within community and bringing it straight into the policy arena. arena. So I would say, let's, let's keep that up. Let's not slow down. Let's not get complacent. This pandemic will pass and the you know, economic systems will shift, but let's not forget what is happening. Let's not forget the inequities that this has scratched the surface of and has revealed and has exacerbated to folks who weren't paying attention before. So let's keep pushing. And I, I really appreciate the efforts of the Women's Foundation to collect data like this directly from impacted communities that leads some credence and some justification to the policy demands that we've been making for years. So it's, it's fantastic to have data and the narratives married together and be able to bring that forward and say, it's happening. It's it's real and we need to do something about it. Right on. <laughs> Nita. I'd, I'd have to say that I am so thankful to the Women's Foundation for, I call them my, being my big sisters because we're not into policy because we're in the trenches, like I keep saying. And so being able to, like Angelica said, have the data to be able to take with us to speak to our why is so imperative. So for all of those who are supporting the Women Foundation, continue to do that and continue to support us who are out here in community making the noise. So thank you for even bringing that out, Angelica. Thank you for making the noise, Nita. We need that. Candace, we need boots on the ground, just like we need people in the C-suite. Yeah, I mean, I think my final thought would be like, we have an opportunity to dream big. You know, I think we need to stop settling um, because the conditions continue to get worse. And let's be honest about that. And so we really need to be calling and asking for more, especially um, with some of the like real realities we're facing when it comes to climate crisis and devastation, um, that like our time is burning and which just should inspire us more to continue to be visionary, to continue to ask for not just what we kind of need, but everything we need and that we deserve. I can imagine a life where I don't ask for what I kind of need. I ask for all I need. Yeah, Candace, right on, Alicia. I love that so hard. I had written that down. We we need and deserve investment of resources. So that that's right there. Um, you know, and the takeaway out of this conversation is to continue listening and centering those who are most impacted. Um, I recall uh, the Senator Sherry Stavitz had said, you know, we have a lot of people um, who have voices. We we just haven't had people who are listening. And so it's not our job to to speak on behalf of anybody else people people can do that but our job is to continue to create spaces like this so that we can get to a place for healing and justice and even ground for everyone our, everyone are within reach and um, i say let's continue to do that and i love that let's not settle 
<laughs> Dr. Joy, thank you, Alicia. Bring us home, please. Yeah, you know, um, I think to just remember that although there is a lot that's going on that we have to take that moment to rest and not quit, um, that, you know, that we have to take the moment to rest. I know I'm always going to talk about the radical self-care that we got to take that moment, but we can't quit and that um, we have to do this and reach across the aisle and not be in isolation. Um, and I think even particularly in this, this pandemic, you know, it pulls us to like be in isolation, but something happens whenever we reach for each other's humanity. Um, and of course, I'm going to end on, you know, may the revolution be healing. I don't think we got to be raggedy revolution revolutionaries, you know what I'm saying? We ain't got to be raggedy with ourselves. We can um, reach out to each other and, and still be filled up. And this can be a beautiful thing. So I say we keep reaching for each other and it can be beautiful. May the revolution be healing, y'all. Now that's a word, as they would say. Each of you has been just magnificent. It has been my honor and privilege to host this panel to center on the genius of women is always a joy. I want to thank the Women's Foundation for doing something that is very unique in the world. You are making equity a verb by putting the most impacted with the people who have the resources to do something about it. And I'm incredibly honored to have been a part of this event in this panel. President Perez, thank you. You have my gratitude. Panelists, brava. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lissa, and all of our panelists. Thank you so much. As you've seen in the chat, you are very inspiring to all of us. And this conversation is exactly what we needed at this time to inspire us to keep going, to continue to listen and continue to learn as we co-create solutions. I mean, the, the parting words that you all left us in terms of the things that we need to keep our eye on are right on. And um, yes, we need to have more of you running for office so that we can create change and, and partner with you. So we honor your words. Uh, we honor your time and your wisdom. And we want to thank you once more for sharing this space with us. And we have already been responding to what we heard in these sessions by increasing our investments in mental health as tied to whole person well-being. You know, we're investing in healing for communities who are experiencing generational trauma and violence and organizational leaders so that they can thrive and do more than survive in the long run. And this is exactly what you've been talking about, Dr. Joy. Uh, we continue to work upstream to invest in preventing violence when it comes to safety. And so this includes increasing investments to groups who work with men and boys on healthy relationships and ending violence. And then lastly, we're continuing to use our position to invest in changing policies to preserve safety, economic opportunity, and leadership for women and girls, particularly those who have been pushed to the margins. And I love what you say, Dr. Joy, like let's just push ourselves right back to the center because we know how important that is. And so um, we want to continue to support the infrastructure of care and make sure that we can keep women in the workforce. And we look forward to continuing to lead that work um, and in all of these areas, frankly, at the Capitol. So again, thank you all so much for inspiring us and may the revolution be healing as Dr. Joy says. Thank you all, take good care, be well.